The end of the world is coming, beloved. The end of the world as we know it. The end of the nations warring against one another. The end of famines. The end of earthquakes is coming. The end of pain and sorrow and death is coming. But before it comes, there is going to come a time of tribulation such as this world has never seen. A time of tribulation upon all nations and a time of tribulation upon the nation of Israel. Jesus wanted to make sure that his disciples, that his followers would know what was going to take place before the end came. And so he was very careful to spell it out. And that's what we're going to do today as we look at the time of the end. Come with me. chapter 24 it says and Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out the temple buildings to him and he said do you see all these things truly I say to you not one stone shall be left on another but all will be torn down do you know where I'm standing dear one I am standing in the midst of the fulfillment of that prophecy We've been looking at Luke 21. We've been looking at the signs of the end. And as Jesus answered those questions, he wanted them to know and understand that before the end ever came, this temple would be destroyed and Jerusalem would be destroyed and the Jews would be scattered throughout all the nations until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So where am I standing right now? Well, we have left the southern steps and now I'm standing along the western wall and I'm standing here amidst the rubble from that time from 70 AD can you imagine oh how I wish you were here with me oh how I wish you were standing right here touching these stones hearing this you don't want to miss coming to Israel you really don't want to miss coming and I want you to know that, that although you hear all these things in the news, that if we ever come, we will not come if it is not safe. But this is where it all took place. I'm standing next to these humongous stones from Herod's time. And you can tell that they're from Herod's time because they were built so large. Now, what I want you to get is a perspective of this part. On the other side of that wall over there is the Western Wall, the Kotel. This is all part of the Western Wall, but that's the sacred part because all of this has only been excavated recently. And that is the closest part to the Holy of Holies. And that's where the Jews go to pray. And that's where you see them in their, in their yarmulkes and in their dress from the various nations to which they were scattered. If you would come along this wall and you would look up with me, you would see a green tree up there. Now, they believe, archaeologists believe, that at once, at one time, that this wall was as tall as that green tree. From the very top of that green tree all the way down here, only a couple more feet, even lower. Now, look up at the wall and see where those stones are jutting out. That was once a huge arch and it came down and it had stairs on it that enabled the people to go up to the Temple Mount that way. Robinson's Arch is so named because it was discovered by, by an archaeologist by the name of Robinson. What I want you to see is I want you to see that I'm walking on the very pavement that was from the time of Jesus, from the time of Herod the Great from the time before Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. And as I walk along these stones, what I want you to do is I want you to watch what happens to my body 
because I'm sinking down into the pavement. I'm sinking down into the pavement where these stones would be thrown down, one stone upon another, until not a stone was left. And as I come down even deeper, you can catch some of the impact of what happened as these stones fell. Do you know that there's a day coming? And it talks about the time of the end when hailstone is going to come down out of heaven and those hailstones are going to weigh about 100 pounds. That's what's going to happen in the time of the end among many other things. And what I want to do is I want to take you now to Matthew 24. And Matthew 24 is a parallel passage with Luke chapter 21. And when you take them and put them together, you can see that Matthew emphasizes one thing and then uh, uh, Luke emphasizes another. And Luke tells about the destruction of this temple. Jesus mentions that when he talks about there's a time coming when one stone will not be left upon another. Now as Jesus says that, he's the master teacher. It provokes questions from his disciples. And he takes them from here and takes them to the Mount of Olives. And there he sits on the Mount of Olives and he answers their questions. Questions that came up from their time as they walked around this Temple Mount area. And it says, and as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? Now remember, I want you to mark time phrases because they're crucial in understanding prophecy. And if you want to, to make sure that you understand what the time of the end will be like, then you need to very carefully watch every time phrase. And this is what he says. What will, when will these things be? When will these stones be cast down and thrown down? And that's what Jesus answers in Luke chapter 21. And then he says, and what will be the sign of your coming? What will show us that you're going to come again? That you're going to come as King of kings and Lord of lords and establish your kingdom? And what will be the sign of the end of the age? Now, if you really want to understand Matthew 24, you have to follow the key repeated words very carefully. And I would suggest once again that you get a red coloring pencil and you mark every reference to the end in red. And you will see that from verse 4 all the way through verse 14, he tells you about what's going to happen before the end comes and when the end is going to come. So it's so typical of the way the Word of God is written. He gives you the broad view, even as I was giving you the broad view as to where we are so that you could understand, so that you could put yourself in context. And then he comes along and he fills in the details. So the first thing he's going to answer to them is what is the sign of the end? And Jesus answered and said to them, see that no one misleads you. And this is a key phrase and I colored it orange. See that no one misleads you. And I want you to know, beloved, if you will stick with me, if you will study with me precept upon precept, if you will learn to study your Bible inductively, then, precious one, you will not be misled because this is truth. This is pure, unadulterated truth. And then you know the truth and the truth will be set you free. And you will not be carried about by every wind of doctrine and cunning craftiness of men by which they lie in wait to deceive. Because what happens so many times is people will come along and say, oh, surely it's the end. I remember when I was in Jerusalem, because I come often, we have an office here, we uh, have a, an apartment, and, and, uh, and we come here often. This is where I wrote my novel, The Whole History of Israel, from 586 B.C., all the way through this time and all the way into the future and the coming of Messiah as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I've lived in this city, I've been in this city. I was here when Netanyahu was, was made prime minister and the country was just rejoicing. I saw him go over to the wall. I was here when, when men were saying, 
Listen, the Oslo Accord is the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9. And in seven years, in the seven years, Jesus Christ is going to be here. What happens? They're misled. And they're misled because they do not know the Word of God. Because they don't understand it. Because they don't follow it carefully. So I'm going to move you through it carefully. Week after week so that you can understand. And he says, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And when they say, I am the Christ, they're saying, I am Messiah. I am the anointed one. I am the promised one. And he says, and they will mislead many. He says, and you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. He says, but see that you're not frightened. Don't be frightened for those things must take place. In other words, when you hear of the wars and when you hear of the rumors of wars, don't be frightened. In a sense, be excited. Why? Because this is a fulfillment of prophecy. All of this is leading up to the coming of the King of Kings. All of this is leading up to a rebuilding of a temple. It's going to be so exciting. He says, but these things must take place and yet that is not yet the end. So once again, you want to color that red. He says, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places, there will be famines and earthquakes. He says, but all these things, all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Have you seen a woman when all of a sudden she grabs her abdomen and she knows, she knows that her child is about to be born? Because all of a sudden she's in labor. All of a sudden there's birth pangs. And he's saying to us, now listen, that's just the beginning of birth pangs. There's a time now of labor, a time before the child is brought forth. And then he says this, then, then, after all this, you want to mark the then again, as I showed you how with that green clock, then they will deliver you to tribulation you to tribulation. Who's the you? He's talking to the Jews and he's talking about a time of tribulation that is going to come to the Jews. Now listen, that time of tribulation is mentioned in Daniel chapter 12. That time of tribulation is mentioned in Daniel chapter 9. That time of tribulation is mentioned here in Matthew and it's mentioned in, in Mark. And what he says is there will come a time of tribulation and they will kill you. And you, you Jews, will be hated of all nations on account of my name, on account of the fact that you are, are, are united with me. You're going to be hated by all nations. He says, and at that time, many will fall away. Now, when he talks about them falling away, he's talking about a time of apostasy. And we're going to look at that later. Because it has to do with Matthew 24 and it has to do with 2 Thessalonians. And it is a sign, a sign that Jesus will be here in three and one half years after that. You see, there are some dates that we can set, that we can know about because God has set them. But we're not to set any date that God hasn't set. And this is what he says. He says, at that time, many will fall away and deliver up one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. And I want you to know that even today, precious one, there are many false prophets. There are many false prophets. You can turn on television and if you don't know the word of God, you can be misled. There are many that are talking about prosperity and there are many that are talking about plenty. And there are many that are talking about ease. And yet Jesus talks about a cross. Jesus talks about suffering. And what does he say? He says, they, but and lawlessness will increase and most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. And what marks the beginning of the end? How are we going to know it if we're here? And will we be here if we're the church? We'll talk about that 
when we come back in just a minute. Oh, beloved, do you know what my favorite thing to do in all of ministry is to go to Israel, is to take a group of people who want to experience God's Word in the land of God's book. At Megiddo, we teach the whole book of Revelation visually, and there is a climax to it that is absolutely awesome. No other tour does this. So if you want to go to the land of the book, and if you want to have God speak to you and make it come alive so that when you come home and you open your Bible, you can see it and you can smell it and you can touch it and you can remember the experience, then go with us. Go now. Go while there is still time. Look at all that's happening in the world. Go and you say, but I'm afraid it's not safe. Oh, for heaven's sakes, God's sovereign and it's safe or we wouldn't go. Go with us. I had never done a real Bible study until I came to do inductive Bible studies. You know, it would sort of been fill in the blanks or whatever, but it had never been study where it wasn't somebody else talking to me. It was me looking in that Bible and digging it out for myself, and then it was mine. Discover truth for yourself through the Precept Inductive Bible Study Method. Visit PreceptsForLife.com. Remember, I told you that from Matthew 24, verse 4, all the way through verse 14, what he's giving us is a panorama of the time of the end. Then he wants to make sure that they understand them, that they have some signs so that they can know when the end is coming. So in Matthew 24, in verse 4, through verse 14, you hear him saying in verse 9, then they will deliver you to tribulation. He's talking to Jews. He's talking to Jews that are followers of him, that believe that he is the Christ, the Messiah. And so when you come down to verse 15, he says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, he takes you from 4 to 14 and shows you what's going to happen when the end comes, how they're going to be delivered to tribulation, how false prophets are going to come, how there's going to be an apostasy, and how the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached to all the world, and then the end shall come. He says, therefore, when you see a therefore, find out what the therefore is there for. So he says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. Now I'm standing on the southern side of the Temple Mount. And you can know in that day that there's going to be a temple up there. You can look and you can see the El Ask Mosque up there. All right? And beyond that will be the temple. And beyond and in that temple, which will be rebuilt before Jesus Christ comes, before the end comes, the abomination of desolation will walk into that place and stand in the holy place. He will stand in the holy of holies. We're going to look at that in our next program. But let me read to you what's going to take place. He says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. It says, let him who is on the housetop not go down to get the things that are in his house. And it says, and let him who is in the field not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those that are with child and to those who nurse babes. And he says, but pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. Why not in the winter? Why not on a Sabbath? He says, for then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world, nor ever shall. In other words, there is a period of time that is coming that is such a great tribulation that it's like nothing that has happened before and it's like nothing that will ever happen again 
It's a unique time in history. And what starts that period of tribulation? What starts that period of tribulation is when the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, walks into the temple and declares himself to be God. And we can know that from that time on will be a period of times, time, and half a time. We know that from Daniel chapter 9. We know that from Daniel chapter 7. We know that from Daniel chapter 12. We know that also from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We know it from Revelation chapter 13. All those tell us that when this abomination of desolation walks into the holy place, declares himself to be God, then it's going to be tribulation to the Jews. Then the Bible tells us that he is going to, that the Antichrist is going to take his throne and he's going to rule over all the earth. Then he's going to overpower the saints of the highest when he's going to overpower the Jews. Then is when Israel is to flee into the wilderness. So he's saying, pray that your flight not be on the Sabbath. Why? Because all the Orthodox Jews that you see in, in their, in their uh, like uniforms, so to speak, their Orthodox dress, and it's all varied because it comes from different parts of the world. Those people will only walk a certain distance on the Sabbath. They won't go any farther. And so they would maybe just get outside of, 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 of the very Jewish quarter and then they would be attacked. And so he's saying, pray that it not be on the Sabbath. He says, pray that it not be in the winter. Why should it not be in the winter? Because in the winter is when the rains come. In the winter is when the floods come. In the winter is when the wadis that go down into the Judean wilderness all of a sudden fill and, and people are drowned. And, and if they're fleeing into the wilderness, then they're going to go through those wadis. And they're going to go through those dry water beds, but all of a sudden the water can come crashing down. Now, they've asked him, what will be the sign of the end? And what will be the sign of the your coming. Well, he says that there will be tribulation unless those days are cut short. No life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, now when he talks about the sake of the elect, if you will think of this as a Jewish chapter, it'll help a lot. Because I really believe at this point that the church is not here. I really believe at this point that the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and that the church is out of here. I really believe that when he talks about the elect, He's talking about that chosen nation, that nation of, of Israel. Remember, we saw that the deliverer is going to come out of that heavenly Zion. And, and, and all Israel is going to be saved because this is the covenant that he made with them when he says, I will take away their sins. It's a covenant that you can see in Jeremiah 31. 31 and the verses that follow to the end of the chapter. This is the covenant that he talks about in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26 and 27 and 28 and even you can read to the end of the chapter. But then he says, then if anyone says to you, then after the abomination of desolation stands in the holy place, if anyone says to you, there's the Christ, no, 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 there's the Christ. And they're saying, go here, go in the inner chambers, go, go to that house, Messiah will be there. He says, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Even those Jews, even those Jews that know the scriptures, they will come and try and mislead. And so what he's saying is you and I have to understand exactly what the scriptures say. Now, those that are going to show those, those false prophets are going to show great signs. They're going to show great wonders. So just beware, beloved, everyone that does a sign, everyone that does a miracle, every time you see something happening it, that, that's, that looks like a miracle doesn't mean that it's always from God. And we'll see that as we study 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But right now, let's go back to Matthew 24, verse 
25. He says, Behold, I have told you in advance. If, therefore, they say to you, He's in the wilderness, do not go forth. Behold, he's in the inner rooms. Do not believe him. If they say, oh, he's over there in the inner room, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east to the west and flashes to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, it will be like that. It will be like a clap of thunder. It will be like lightning, light lightning up the skies and we will look up and we will see the coming of the Son of Man. Now listen to me very, very carefully. We who have believed in Jesus Christ, we who down through the ages have followed him, we who have been faithful unto death, we who have persevered in the faith, we who have been saved by faith, and grace alone and have received Christ as our Messiah will be coming with him. We will be coming with him in clouds of glory. Now, he goes on to say, and wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the skies and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Listen, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds on the sky and with power and with great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. This, beloved, is his promise. This is his promise. You don't need to go to an inner room. You don't need to go to that chamber. You don't need to go to the wilderness. Why? Because all the earth will see the coming of the Son of Man. That is the end. That is the end. And what's going to happen? Well, Luke 21 tells us that men's hearts will faint for fear and from the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And he says, but when these things take place, straighten up, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Beloved, the signs show us his coming is soon. Thank you for watching today. For books or Bible study materials discussed on this program, visit our website at preceptsforlife.com. For more information about Precept Ministries International, log on to our website, preceptsforlife.com, or call us today at 1-800-763-1990. And join us next time as we look at more Precepts for Life.